This is David Frederick, and I'm front row. Welcome to Battle of the Belts. In uh, September 2nd, 1985, at the University of Southern Florida Sundome, 7,600 in attendance. I tell you, Championship Wrestling from Florida and their fans, they took pride in this show. Hurricane Alina uh, really hit hard on the, in the Gulf Coast of um, in the Upper Florida and uh, the, the Southern States. And um, with this show, uh, Battle of the Belts, um, will be similar to, it's pretty much the predecessor to what the uh, Crockett would do with C Class of the Champions in 1988, a live broadcast, live broadcast from Florida, uh, University of Southern Florida Sundome. Um, re I'm going to be repeatedly use this word, Championship Wrestling from Florida. These fans and the company took pride in this show to run a show um, it was 7,000 attendants during a hurricane, and the lights kept going on and off. Not severely enough. They, they, I think at one moment during the first match, the power went out. They lost, you know, they, they lost, uh, it, it's, po it's possible, I don't know whether it was a commercial, I don't think it was a commercial, uh, because it was a live, a live broadcast, or they did, they did lose camera or power, but you will see the lights dimmer a lot during the first match, if not the, the most of the matches tonight, but a lot of pride. That Florida takes running a show with 7,600 showing up during a major hurricane. Incredible. Um, Gordon Sully, the Dean of Announcers from Florida, and a uh, longtime uh, second generation wrestler Mike Graham will be announcing for this show. Uh, one match would be changed during the show. It was going to be, uh, I believe it was AWA World Champion. Um, Nick Bonkwinkle, if I'm not mistaken, I got to see the card, but uh, he was supposed to take on Rick Martell. Rick Martell was held back. It was announced held back by airline tra airline problems, no doubt with his hurricane bearing down on them. Um, the opening match, uh, Hector and Chavo Guerrero versus Rip Oliver and the Grappler. You know, again, I'm going to repeatedly use the word pride, and still the, the opening tag match, no, there's never and nothing boring about Florida wrestling. Championship wrestling from Florida, CWF. Nothing boring about the, these matches. Uh, very good, decent opening match. It's, you know, I would say, I was going to open up the show as welcome back to the territories. These guys worked for a living. You know, there was no talking. They just wrestled. Good opening tag team match. It's kind of funny that, um, you know, I don't know how many wrestlers would use the uh, nickname or middle name of the Crippler, Rip Oliver. Uh, so Hector and Chavo Guerrero would take on Rip Oliver, and he was uh, considerably and constantly called the Crippler, uh, where a future wrestler, um, Chris Benoit, would also use the name Crippler. It's just how many wrestlers would use the name the Crippler against Mask uh, and Rip Oliver tagged with the Mask the Grappler. Very good opening tag team match. Um, I say again, no, nothing boring about anything Florida ever did, and uh, the match ends with the grappler was doing kind of something weird with his boots, similar to what the Iron Sheik would do, uh, st you know, uh, hammering his foot into the mat. And uh, Gordon Sully, he said he was positioning the foot, his his his, uh, his boot, and to hit um, the uh, the Guerreros. And uh, instead, uh, the grappler, uh, uh, right figure, yeah, Rip Oliver was holding Hector Guerrero, and the grappler went to he. This is the strange part. He was uh, kicking his boot into the mat, like positioning his boot for somehow. But the grappler instead used his knee, and the knee connected with Rip Oliver. Instead, knocked him down. Hector covers Rip Oliver for the win. Our second match of the night here at Battle of the Belts in Florida. Uh, Coco Samoa with Lady Maxine versus Rip Rogers with Miss Brenda. <laughs> Miss Brenda, I, I swear she, she looks so much like Baby Doll, Nicola Roberts. She, as sometimes I look at her, it, it, it isn't the same person, but she looks, she looks so much like my Baby Doll. Um, Coco Samoa, I tell you one thing with this show of uh, Battle of the Belts in Florida. Uh, it's a mixture of uh, Pacific Northwest, Memphis, Florida wrestlers. It's a it's a it's a mixture. It's a, you know, it's a it's a clash of different territories. <laughs> it's one thing about the Latin territories; they always enjoy mixing up, you know, their their talent. Uh, Lady Maxine, I remember seeing her in a lot in the UWF Mid South area. Uh, <clears throat> really tall, six foot four. 
and she was there to prevent um, any uh, interference by Miss Brenda on on Hustler Rip Rogers. Uh, you know this. You no, know, for a second match, this went eleven minutes in comparison to the first match. The only, only major, also major difference in this uh, match was I don't know, maybe the hurricane subsided, the rain, a major rainstorm subsided because they did not lose a lot of power or the lights dimming, not a lot compared to the first match. But eleven minutes. Um, you know, decent back and forth. Uh, I said these matches will not be boring for Florida at all. Um, the one thing that stood up very interesting that Gordon Sully would point out, I believe it was Gordon Sully, uh, with Gordon Sully and Mike Graham doing commentating, they pointed out that the, ev the evacuation of the hurricane, um, that the uh, it's September and it'll be football season, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, I guess they halted uh, play. Uh, NFL play where the fans of Florida, uh, no, they came out to see this show. <laughs> Florida's interesting. No, NFL versus football. Uh, the ending of this match came. Uh, they, the lady Maxine was there to prevent Miss Brenda's interference, but Miss Brenda found, no got hit. She stepped in. I expected Lady Maxine to jump in the ring, uh, but the referee blocked her. Uh, Miss Brenda used her purse and smacked uh, Coco Small on the head. Uh, he was holding with Rogers. And uh, then Lenny Maxine came, and Rip Ro Rip um, Rip Rogers, uh, he got him into a, bo into a, 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 a body slam, I think. And Lady Maxine pulls, <laughs> he, she pulls Coco Masola down on top of Rip Rogers. I think it was she Rip Rogers' hair. She pulled Rip Rogers' hair, Rip Rogers' hair, and pulled him down. Coco Masola going to cover, and Coco Masola wins eleven minutes defeating Rip Rogers. With the help of Lady Maxine, ironically. Our third match tonight for the Florida Heavyweight Championship. Jack Hart is the Florida champion with Percy Pringle as the manager against a young Kendall Wyndham. Now, what's going to be surprising, you know, <laughs> what, I'm, I'm stunned at J who Jack Hart really is. In just a few short years, and this is 1985, you know, when I started uh, as a wrestling fan in 1986 and a year later, I'm stunned to, re to uh, you know, I had to do a little quick research on Jack, who Jack Hart is. He would become WWF's most notable, well-known jobber and talent and enhancement, Barry Horowitz. Now, watching this match versus, you know, uh, Mike Graham kept saying a young Kendall Wyndham. Jack Hart, I could see why he became a talent enhancement, a, a, a jobber. I could see why, you know. Um, you know, I, do, 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 that, do, would that sound disrespectful? That's hard to really, um, uh, not disrespect, but, you know, what, the addition was, he started back in, I, it, look, he started in 1979, and he worked in, in the Florida Territory, um, you know, he, uh, it looks like he had defeated, uh, Mike Graham in a tournament final for the vacant Florida title, um, with, a this match went pretty long. Where I got twelve minute match, and uh, Jack Hart, I swear, it, and, uh, as he would become Barry Horowitz, because he worked far better as a he looked seemed more he looked more better as a a, a, a talent has been jobber in WWF than he did in this match. Um, Kendall Wyndham, you know, as young as he is, the younger brother Barry Wyndham, and uh, his father's the legendary Black Jack Mulligan, and. Uh, you know, Kendall Wyndham did look much more impressive in this match than Jack Hart. You know, uh, I should have realized that was Barry Horowitz with his, you know, the black hair and the, and the curly hair, and his, be his beard. I could see, you know, I could see more. It's, it's. I'm stunned I didn't recognize him at first, why who Jack Hart really was. But uh, Kendall Wyndham, uh, and the younger brother Barry Wyndham. You know, he has a he, he's second generation wrestler. Uh, comes in a great wrestling family, probably already, you know, train, you know, who worked with Dusty Rhodes. Um, you know, I remember, uh, I tend to win him a lot in the, in, you know, in my, in the, watching the Crockett days in, in, in the, in the late 19, in the, in the 1980s. But, uh, Kendall Wyndham was much more of an impressive wrestler than Jack Hart. That's, that's for sure. And, uh, Kendall Wyndham became a house of fire, got the crayons growing, got going, and uh, he came up with a crossbody block and surprised uh, Jack Hart, winning the Florida heavyweight title from him. And Mike Graham commented, you know, it's impressive to see Kendall Wyndham win the Florida title in, in, in his early part of his career. Yes, it is. And we have a title change 
during their first battle of the belt show during a hurricane. <laughs> it just it was an interesting third match, but it's it's uh, it was interesting to find out who Jack Hart really was, who he would become. But Kendo and Wyndham was definitely much more of a uh, house of fire, much more of a better wrestler than than Jack Hart in this match. That's for sure. All right, our fourth match tonight: Southern Heavyweight Champion Ravishing Rick Rude with Percy Pringle versus Billy Jack Haynes. And uh, Billy Jack Haynes is co-holder. He brought he brought a title belt, and I wasn't sure at first. I looked I had to take a good close look at it. It is I yeah, I just remember I had remembered he is co-holder of the Florida-based U.S. Tag Team title with Wahoo McDaniel because I remember it's 19, 1985 and at Stark 85, him and Wahoo McDaniel would defend the U.S. Tag Team title. Um, now Rick Rude with uh, Percy Pringle. Percy Pringle was in you know in the into the in 1990s would become the uh, Another man, another man, uh, well, uh, manager, name, ch change of name, and his uh, actual uh, professional uh, background, uh, he become uh, Paul Bearer. That's you know, Percy Pringle was a long time you know, uh, southern a southern manager, uh, world class. He is a long time manager, Rick Rude. Um, Rick Rude would you know work a do a lot of work with world class championship wrestling down in Texas with Von Erichs and whatnot. And uh, Percy Pring was a long time manager. Okay, before the match before this match takes place, they have an interview uh, interviewing uh, with uh, Harley Race talking about his upcoming tag team match with Stan Hansen against the Road Warriors for the AWA tag team titles. Harley Race is being interviewed by Coach David Heath. Now I think he has got to be some kind of uh, University of Florida coach because I was looking his name up. I could not find this, I, and I apologize if I do not know this name. If he's a legendary coach of a Florida University coach, or he's a uh, a professional coach, I'm not sure. I looked his name up, and I could not find anything related to a coach David Heath. They did not say what he did, but I assume he's a Fl a Florida University. Um, University of Southern Florida, um, a sports coach of some kind, maybe football, I don't know. But he, he, he's a decent interviewer, I'll give him that. He no, made no mistakes, he was not uh, really uh, not sure now how to talk to these wrestlers. No, he did a decent job, he, t he, he was talking with Harley Race. Now, also during, in, during the Harley Race interview, something occurs on the screen. Um, a TV identification. Now this is uh, live from Florida. But uh, the TV identification came up, okay, KRLD Channel 33, Dallas, Fort Worth. So this, this was aired in Texas also. Okay, interesting. Um, now with the uh, entrances of Rick Rude and Billy Jack Haynes, Billy Jack Haynes, both guys, muscular, holy cow. And they're, and they're, they're, Billy Jack Haynes um, was really over with this crowd. Wow. He came in with the uh, a great song, a great '80s song. I'm a big fan of this song, um, "Holding Out for a Hero," and uh, wow, big pop, man! The crowd jump. I mean, the girls are dancing. Did he, Billy Jack Haynes came out like a like a rock and roll express pop. I mean, the crowd pop for him. Wow, I mean, girls were dancing around him, and they were they loved the music. Or you know, he was really, really Billy Jack Haynes was really over with this Florida crowd, and he's a Pacific Northwest star. And he's going against uh, Southern Heavyweight Champion Rick Rude. He came out to his typical. He has used this song, Smooth Operator, for many, many years, especially world-class years. Um, now, th now th when they first get in the ring, you know, the first thing out of mouth of Mike Graham and, and Gordon Sully is, these guys are muscular. Holy cow. <laughs> they are. They were showing, no, uh, it was like, almost like a, a super pose down that Ultimate Warrior and Rick Rude would do you know, in, in much later in, into the late 80s. Um, that's what, no, it, it almost seemed like a, 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 a Rick, a Rick Rude Ultimate Warrior match, but Billy Jack Haynes, yes, I was a fan of Billy Jack Haynes when I first started, uh, big muscular guy, popular, and, um, oh, it, it, it was, you know, it was a pretty good, you know, very, another, another, like I said, this show is not boring whatsoever, and, and these guys worked this show, and despite the fact, you know, in, 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 in the midst, in, into the midst of the match, um, Gordon and, and Mike would say that, that that it's still pouring rain outside and interfering with lights and maybe cameras. You know, mo except for the first match, uh, the lights did dimmer on the camera on the cameras. 
uh, a lot. But no, next in the next couple of matches, including this, I didn't see. They said that the the that the light, the thunder and lightning are interfering, shaking the cameras. I did not see that. But they said that the Hurricane Alina, it's it's uh, thunder and lightning and, and major rain is uh, doing a job on the show. Not really. Only the first match it did. Um, you know, it was you know, here's about Billy Jack Haynes with his full Nelson uh, hold. Um, there's one thing that, that Billy Jack Haynes tried to grab Rick Root a couple of times with this, and Mike Graham said, "I've never seen anyone get out of the, out of the full Nelson. If he gets it on, it's over." Uh, one thing about the, the Mike Graham and Gordon Sully, especially Gordon Sully, will constantly do about every match of this show is point out their amateur background, whether it's high school, college, whatever they did, amateur work, if they've won t amateur tournaments and championships, they constantly said that. Now, I'm not dishing that at all. I'm not putting it down. But it's a, it's a constant repeat statement by Gordon Sully a lot. He, he, looked, he always um, focused, he focused on, the, on the amateur background of any wrestler. No, it's interesting. It's interesting. The thing I think I had to point out, he always did that. Uh, you know, I, anyone who knows me has watched these interview, watched these reviews I've done. Any match that involves Rick Root, I am no fan of Rick Root, and anybody that knows me knows that. And maybe it's the Chip and Dale image that he, and, you know, uh, I, I've never been a fan of Rick Root, but this was a decent work, no, decent match. I said the whole show is great. Anything of Florida is great. Um, uh, you know. These guys are so muscular and a uh, you know, really hard-fought match. But it came down to Percy Pringle. Now, here's the thing. I think it's referee Bill Alfonso, that was, a young Bill Alfonso, was referee. And the point where, where Percy Pringle gets his little crappy little wooden cane involved. And Percy Pringle's up on the ring apron. And uh, and Bill Alfonso, I think it's a referee, trying to get him you know, get off the, you know, get out of the ring. And he hands... Um, Rick Rude the cane, and Rick Rude starts be uh, be no belting Billy Jack Haynes on I mean once or twice on the back, and Bill Alfonso's standing there, not really having his back. He, he's he's his, he's like side to side, and, and it's not like he has his back turned. How did that referee did not see Rick Rude? You no, know, it, it's not like it was a really hard impact hit with a cane, and it looked like a stick cane, a, a stick cane too. It's not much. I don't see how the referee missed. Um, Rick Root hitting Billy Jack Haynes. He hit him twice, and it was really a small couple of impacts. It was nothing, but Billy Jack Haynes went down, and Rick Root covered him, pinned him, and uh, Rick Root remains the Southern Heavyweight Champion. Fifth match in the night: the AWA World Tag Team Champions, the Road Warriors. They would take on, and with Paul, their manager Paul Percy Paul Ellering would take on a very experienced, most two most one of the most two most experienced wrestlers there are in the world. However, as a tag team, I wouldn't put together. I wouldn't put them together as a tag team. Maybe in Japan, but not in the United States. Uh, seven times NWA World Heavyweight Champion with Harley Race and the Wild Man from Burger, Texas, Stan Alaric Hansen. Now, when Harley Race did his interview with Coach uh, David Heath, he said that I'm going to be teaming with uh, Stan Hansen, the PWF champion, which was the in Japan the Pacific Wrestling Federation champion. But that's never mentioned in this in this match. Nor is Stan Hansen holding the title belt the way um, Billy Jack Keynes was holding the Florida uh, U.S. tag title belt. And that's never mentioned. Interesting that uh, Florida doesn't mention other title belts. Now, uh, interesting when they first, when these guys first enter, uh, approached the ring, Harley Race, Stan Hansen, again, I, I wouldn't pick, I wouldn't picture, put together Stan Hansen and Harley Race in, um, in definitely in Japan I would put these guys together. But not for a United States match. But it's Florida. You know, Florida did everything. <laughs> did every, all kinds of matches. Um, Harley Race and Stan Hansen are pro strangely. This is. I was trying to figure out what music they were using, and it took me a while to figure out. Oh yeah, they're losing. You're using the Olympic, the Olympic theme music. The Olympic, uh, uh, sport, the Olympic competition that takes place over four years in the United States. The Olympic uh, theme music. Uh, they approached with, and it's. Strange, I've never known any wrestlers to use that kind of music. Uh, and in the Road Warriors, now, I don't know whether it was the announcer interfering with the music when he was announcing who was coming to the ring. The Road Warriors would definitely use their iconic Iron Man song by Ozzy Osbourne, Black Sabbath. Um, you could hear the music start as they entered the door area. 
but it stopped. Then um, the, the, the announcer an announcer is announcing the uh, rowers approach it as they approach. Then you could hear the Iron Man music continue. I don't know if it was the uh, announcer's microphone that was cutting cutting the music off. But, um, well, the Road Warriors, R Race, and Hanson, they, a total and complete brawl, as um, Florida announcer Gordon Sully would always call it a Pier 6 brawl, out-of-control brawl. It's how he described out-of-control brawls, the Pier 6 brawl. They were brawling everywhere, everywhere possible. Uh, you know, this match could have been a, a uh, anywhere in, anywhere on the floor of the Sun Dome. <laughs> Uh, Road Warriors and 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 Hanson and and Harley Race now Stan Hanson Harley Race, un yes, unbelievably tough brawlers, experienced. One thing that that uh, Gordon Sully kept constantly repeating was seven times NWA World Champion Harley Race over and over. That seven times over and over and over describing Harley Race, and he either called him Stan Stan the Man Hanson Stan. The Larry Hansen, uh, the bad man from Borger, Texas. Okay, good, good announcing, uh, describing who they are. But this was a par uh, brawl at first. You know, the way this matches end, you think that's how the match begins. They were brawling everywhere. Um, they uh, went all the way to the bleachers with, in using the ch chairs. Animal and uh, Hansen were, but were start attacking each other with the plastic chairs. Hawk and Race back and forth. No, here's the thing. Individually. Now, even though the Road Warriors were just their, their incredible strength, that's one thing D that Gordon Sully kept pointing out, that despite the fact that the Road Warriors' incredible strength, they're still new to the business. They are the AWA World Tag Team Champions, but they're new to the business. They've only been about three years so far, and they're going against very experienced wrestlers, Race and Hansen, who wrestle around the world. Yes, the Road Warriors have been around the world, too. But they are going against very experienced wrestlers. That's the only thing competitively that Race and Hanson had together. But I don't know if they've ever been. I don't. Know, I'm not sure if they've ever been tag team together. Probably, most probably in Japan. Now they've been getting here in the United States. I do not know. Um, but it was a massive brawl between you know separating. You know, the Road Warriors are using their, their, their brute strength against Race and Hansen's experience. And Race and Hansen can hold their own in any kind of brawl, any kind of match. Eventually, they did work, come to work in the ring. It became a, 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 a good uh, tag team match, a good, um, you know, tag outs back and forth between the two teams. At one moment, the, uh, one time, the uh, Road Warriors, you know, you, 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 who, who the hell are the, uh, who are the, um, Heels and the good, the good guys and the bad guys here. Now I would assume, I would assume the crowd's going for the Road Warriors. Um, at, at one moment, I think that it, it, in a in a cheating situation, Hawk and Animal switched. Um, at hold, at, at holding, I believe they're holding race, and Hawk and Animal switched places as a referee. Again, I think Bill, a young Bill Alfonso, um, they switched places in, in a headlock. And the referee did not notice that one. That's interesting where, where faces, but with the Road Warriors, whether faces or heels, good guys, bad guys, it didn't matter to them. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time the Road Warriors were never, were never not cheered. And that, and that occurs much years later in 1988 when they do turn heel and they win the tag team titles. The, nobody could never, the fans, you will never know. We mean with the exception of the attack on Dusty Rhodes, his eye, the eye spike attack in, on WTBS, I believe, in 1988. The only time the Rowers were never... I, can you name a time the Rowers were never not? Have they ever been uh, booed? Can you name a time the Rowers are ever booed? I don't think so. <laughs> That's how popular they are, however they are. You can't turn them heel. They can act heel. They can act like brawlers. That's heels. But this is a, it was a brawling match. It was a slightly a tag team match. Slightly, they were working in the ring. But eventually, um, I think it was uh, one of the the rowers and Richard Hansen. They they go over the top rope and then end up brawling back outside the ring. However, Bill Alfonso, it's like he's making this count out this count outside the ring very quickly. It's not a long ten count. It maybe last, I'd say, the count, his, he's swinging his arm so fast, it's about, maybe five, six seconds, it seems. But it, he, um, 
he does count out uh, the Rogue Warriors, Harley Race and Stan Hansen, the match ends in a double count out. Yeah, you would think so for a match like this. It, uh, that it, it, I'm, I'm more surprised it, it didn't end in a double disqualification, but it ended in a double count out. Okay, the sixth match of the night was supposed to be AWA World Heavyweight Champion Rick Bartel against Nick Bonkwinkle. Problems. Okay, due to the Hurricane Alina and disruption in um, airlines and travel, Rick Martel could not appear. Where the problem in this match occurs, okay, uh, apparently um, Frankie Lane, who is being put over as a, gr a good wrestler, I think I remember him as a jobber and talent enhancement, and, and I believe in Crockett, and I, I, or WWF, I'm not exactly sure. I know the name, he, he, I think he was a talent enhancement or jobber. Um... The strangest thing occurs with Nick Bonkwinkle. Now, he comes out to a music I can't even figure out. I have no clue what it was. Then, he's announced as, okay, the, the announce, who announces this match, let alone Rick Martell missing, and he's the world champion, AWA world champion. The announcer announces, uh, this is a world, the announcer announces this match is a world title match. First comment is, he announces Nick Bonkwinkle as the current AWA World Champion. And I made that big mistake myself when I said that, um, that no, Nick, no, Nick Bonkwinkle, uh, the AWA World Champion versus Rick Martell at the, at the one of the beginning, at the beginning of, of doing this show. And I apologize um, because, no, I, no, I didn't. I, I have, in my reviews, I've done Midland Crockett and, and WWF. I have not covered a show of this nature yet and did not know of... Uh, the time period of who the current world champion was, and it was not Nick Bond, it was Rick Martell, world champion at the current time period, September in 1985, and he was supposed to face Rick, Nick, Nick Bonkwinkle. I also messed up and said Nick Bonkwinkle was a world champion. The announcer announces Nick Bonkwinkle world champion, and it's obvious Nick Bonkwinkle does not, he is not, does not hold the title belt around his waist. <laughs> and the announcer with a, with a paper in his hand saying that Nick Bonkwinkle was the world champion. <laughs> And uh, Gordon Sully, Mike Graham, stressing that Rick Martell is not a ducking champion. He's not avoiding the match or the show. They actually said that the, the, the counties in the area being evacuated because it's hurricane, and that uh, the count in, in the counties that they're in, the county they're in, has been evacuated. That's why it's impressive that 6,700 showed up for this show. Wow. But this match was reduced to a, 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 you know, a last minute opponent uh, for Nick Bonk, Wiggle of Ace, Frankie Lane. Wasn't much of a match, though Gordon Sully and Mike Graham are putting over Pranky Lanes that he's a, a good competitor. He's not. Um, Nick Bonkwinkle works with him. I'll give Nick Bonkwinkle credit. I have not mo watched much of Nick Bonkwinkle. I read a lot about him. Um, when I was a teenager reading the wrestling magazines, he was a top, definitely a top-notch veteran wrestler in the, in the American Wrestling Association. Um, but the match with Frankie Lane, it's just a jobber match. Honest to God, it is. And, and the, the ending of this match I found ridiculous. That Frankie Lane goes to go a, a, a crossbody block and Nick Bonkwinkle is practically doesn't even sell it. He stood there. Frankie fell to the ground. Nick Bonkwinkle covered for a quick a four-minute match. According to online records, it's a four-minute match. It was just a standby match for Nick Bonkwinkle to have somebody to face. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Okay, the seventh and final match, the main event for the Battle of Belts here on in Tampa, in Florida. Uh, 203 Falls, the NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair is defending against Chief Wahoo McDaniel. Now, Wahoo McDaniel is one half of the uh, Florida U.S. Tag Team t Champions, and he is he brought the belt with him, but he's not announced as champion. He's announced he's announced as former Miami Dolphins NFL Pro Football Player. Very true. Uh, Ric Flair announced from Minneapolis, Minnesota, rather than hasn't moved to Charlotte yet. The, one of the strange part of an announcement of this match is that this is a world uh, uh, an NWA World Title match. The announcer says. National World Alliance. <laughs> the announcer really, sc he screwed up a few times in this show. Um, when well, Mike Graham and, and, and Gordon Sully, re really interesting comments that where Flair is, no, he, he will uh, escape to the outside 
uh, in a very, very early part of this match, you know, to walk around, get bearings, try to escape. Wow, McDaniel at times, he said, uh, will, Flair, will Flair get on his bicycle? <laughs> um, one thing also, very early in the match, and he doesn't do a lot of bleeding yet, um, before, the, before the first fall, is Flair bleeds early, and I don't think it was planned or intentional blade job. I don't think so. I think it's possibly maybe Wahoo McDaniel's chops, or something occurred, a very tiny cut occurs on Flair's head, and it doesn't spread. Where Flair usually has his hair and head a uh, crimson mask. It, it, no, he has not bled yet in the first 20 some odd minutes of this match, two out of three falls. And, um, you know, the Met, it's 1985, and Flair's had the title since 1981. He's announced as a three-time champion. Um, both are ring generals already. Wahoo McDonald's wrestled since the 60s. Now, here's, here's also a, bi a big thing I... I, I, um, I ch now, I challenge anybody to correct me wrong about this. I think, except for maybe min the Mid-Atlantic era in the 70s, I think this Battle of the Belt show is the first television or first film of Wahoo McDaniel against Ric Flair. And I know they probably faced hundreds if not thousands of times yet. Both the ring generals, Ric Flair has great respect for Chief Wahoo McDaniel. When Ric Flair had his 1975 plane crash, Wahoo McDaniel was the first one to visit him. Both have great respect for each other. But I don't think a they've all, they probably had tons of house show matches. Uh, to be on camera, be on videotape, I don't think... I think this is the very first match ever seen of Wild McDowell against Ric Flair. Now, there might be Mid-Atlantic film in the 70s of them, too, from house shows. But uh, so far, yeah, as Washington Ring Generals... Classic wrestling match. You're never bored with Ric Flair, never bored with Wahoo McDaniel. And uh, the first fall comes, interestingly and strangely enough, that uh, Wahoo McDaniel captures Ric Flair in a sleeper hold. And he puts him down in a sleeper hold. Rather uh, no, than a sleeper go out with a sleeper, like the referee Bill Alfonso was. Yeah, referee Bill Alfonso uh, was uh, throwing, was uh, checking Ric Flair's arms if he was going out with a sleeper hold. And he waved, he, he checked his arms, Ric Flair was going out, he tried to grab the ropes, he was going out. It's unusual for any wrestler, and you know, especially the champion, to go out in a sleeper. Very unusual, usually they fight it. Ric Flair went out, and Bill Alfonso uh, kept checking his arms. No, and you think about maybe once or twice, I thought three times. Uh, he let, he got to a point where Ric Flair was down and flat on the mat, and he counted he counted a three count for the first fall to go to Wahoo McDaniel. Two ring generals, it's amazing. Ric Flair and Wahoo McDaniel working on the second fall, amazing. What can I say? You know, I said it's a rarity of seeing Ric Flair versus Wahoo McDaniel in a, on camera. Again, I said this about the first fall, um, unless it was a Mid-Atlantic era, Mid-Atlantic in the seventies. To see Ric Flair against Wahoo McDaniel, and this is the first match I've ever seen him in a televised match on camera. And wow, ama amazing match going for the second fall. Wow, the, w two ring generals working and punishing and beating the hell out of each other. Wow, great. I mean, wow. Now the match finally spilled out to the uh, outside, and Rick, you know, it's, what's what's really. Uh, oddly different for a Ric Flair match that goes such a distance against a, a fellow a ring general where if he were facing Dusty Rhodes, it would have been a bloodbath. This is not really a bloodbath whatsoever. Ric Flair hasn't bled. Amazingly. Amazingly. Um, but the outside, and outside the ring, they, 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 are, they go outside the ring and uh, Flair rams Wahoo's head into the ring post. He gets busted open a little bit. And uh, as soon as he, he rolls Rahu's, uh, Wahoo back into the ring, um, Flair drops a knee, a knee over his head, and uh, Flair covers him and gets and gets, a, and gets and for a pinball and gets the second scores the second fall. Um, you name it in the second fall, they every move in the book they did it. You know, um, Wahoo McDaniel almost scored a a, a uh, uh, the second fall himself to, to end it two nothing. He almost did. Um, there was a collision, a ref bump, where Ric Flair rammed into Bill Alfonso, and uh, Bill Alfonso was down a little bit, and Wahoo McDaniel did a, tried a backslide on Flair. And the thing I was watching, that if I were to count, the mat, count that fall, I don't think it would have been barely a three count, just barely. But um, Ric Flair has scored the second fall 
just you no, know, he's you no. Know, Wahoo McDaniel is really tiring. Has really tired out in this match. Um, as as Wahoo, he Wahoo is he ran Wahoo in, um against ring post, rolled him in and dropped the knee, and uh, Wahoo's wearing down now. And Flair scored the second fall, uh, cut, you know, grabbing the leg and pinning him. Flair has now the second fall. The third and deciding fall, this two out of three falls match between World Champion Ric Flair and, and Wahoo McDaniel. Wow, it really came down. Wow. Um, Wahoo chased after Flair, and it, as I said before, Ric Flair, it's rare for Ric Flair not to bleed in a, in a great world title match a long period of time, and that didn't last. Uh, they went outside the ring, and uh, Wahoo rammed Flair at least two to three times into the ring post, and his face became a crimson mask. Wow. Uh, Wahoo really, I said he had a chafed after Flair to get that final fall, but, you know, Rick, um, Rick Flair, knowing where he was, know, you know, he knows what's going on, um, it came down to, um, Wahoo McDaniel reapplied the sleeper hold, and Gordon Sully, Mike Graham saying, you know, if he can do, he did it once to see if he can do it again, Wahoo McDaniel trying to do the, the, the uh, sleeper hold, put Flair to sleep, and, and Flair kept going after, you no, know, trying to grab the ropes. He he kept trying to um, grab the ropes and break, maybe break the hold. But uh, the closer Flair got to the ropes, as Wahoo held a sleeper hold, then Flair, with his feet kicked backwards, and they both fell down. Wahoo still held the sleeper hold on Ric Flair. Flair on top of Wahoo. Wahoo was only was continuing, continually held the sleeper hold on Flair. But Flair, as they fell backwards, Flair's on top of Wahoo. And Wahoo's shoulder was down. Bill Alfonso ca counts Wahoo's shoulders down. Ric Flair pinned R Wahoo McDaniel because Wahoo was holding Ric Flair in a sleeper. And Flair kicked them backwards. Off the, he, they got cl close to the turnbuckle and Flair kicked them both backwards. Flair, Wahoo McDaniel fell, back, fell down, fell backwards. Flair still cut. Flair was covering because Wahoo, who was holding him in the sleeper, and all that's all Wahoo knew is he held onto the sleeper. But Flair covered Wahoo. Bill Elf, referee Bill Alfonso counted the three count. So Ric Flair remains world heavyweight champion, winning two out of three falls. If you like this video, please subscribe, comment, like or dislike, and thank you for watching.